Good morning. <clears throat> the committee will come to order. I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for this important and much needed hearing. Entitled 21st Century <clears throat> Food Systems Controlled Environment Agriculture Role in Protecting Domestic Food Supply, Chain, and Infrastructure. After opening brief remarks, members will receive testimony from our witness today, and then the hearing will be open for questions. Members will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of arrival for those members who have joined us after the hearing was called to order. And when you are recognized, you will be asked to please mute your microphone. And each person will have five minutes to ask your question or make a comment. And if you are not speaking, I ask that you remain muted in order to minimize any background noise. In order to get to as many questions as possible, the timer will be stay consistently visible on your screen. This is a vitally important meeting. It comes at a time also, ladies and gentlemen, that we will have uh, possible votes at 1230. It is now 10. That gives us two and a half hours, and then it will end. We are going to have a long series of these votes. And uh, so I'm just asking everybody, we have a lot of people, a lot of interest, and we want to get everybody in, in time. And um, <clears throat> I want to start myself by giving a very brief uh, opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, this is so important. Uh, the future of our food supply is at stake. And today's hearing comes at a very pivotal moment in our nation's history. The future of our nation's food security. And we have a panel of very distinguished witnesses who specialize in innovative ways to make sure that we keep our nation's food secure and what we're talking about comes under a new category, controlled environment agriculture, using cutting edge technologies. And uh, so I definitely want to welcome all of you here. And with that, I will turn it over to the ranking member for his opening statement. Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, and thank you to our witnesses for, for the, making the time to be with us today. I'm eager to learn more about your contributions to this sector of our agriculture industry. As I've said before, I hope our committee will move, move uh, to hold hearings that explore the issues facing production agriculture, provide opportunities for oversight of the 2018 Farm Bill, and receive updates from officials in the administration, including Secretary Vilsack. A hearing to review the state of the rural economy and our agriculture industry is long overdue, and I, I appreciate the chairman's commitment to hold this, this hearing with the secretary following the August work period. Thanks to innovation uh, in agricultural technologies, American farmers and ranchers and foresters are not only conserving resources, but they're doing it while producing more food, feed, and fiber. Productivity relative to resource use for agriculture is up 200 and 87% in the United States since the 1940s, while total farm inputs remain mostly on change, the most efficient and productive agriculture in the world. Our specialty crop producers have also been able to adopt innovative technologies over time to increase yields while decreasing inputs. Examples of these innovations can include uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, aeroponics, and other greenhouse production methods. While well, hydroponics and these other methods of production in a controlled environment are not new concepts, there's an increased interest in utilizing these methods to supplement traditional production agriculture 
to ensure Americans have year-round access to domestic fresh fruits and vegetables and to decrease our dependency on foreign countries to supply those same products. Um, the diverse panel no, of yes. experts before us represent all mm -hmm. segments of our hydroponic and other controlled environment methods of production. And I think this hearing presents an opportunity to learn more about their work, contributions to agriculture, and where do we go to from here? As I said earlier, I believe these innovative production methods are meant to supplement production agriculture, not supplant. It takes all sectors of our agriculture industry working together to ensure that the United States can continue to have the safest, most abundant, and most affordable food and fiber supply in the history of the world. And controlled environment agriculture is a piece of that larger puzzle. I'd like to thank our witnesses once again for being here uh, with us, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. And with Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. And uh, without objection, I'd like to insert into the record this letter brought to me by our distinguished colleague, Representative Barbara Lee of California. Thank you. With that, I now like to welcome the distinguishing panel that we have. Uh, before I get to that, the chair would also reckon, uh, request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that we have ample time for all of our questions. Now I'm very delighted to introduce our witnesses. We are very delighted to have you here a very distinguished panelist. Our, very, our first witness today is Mr. Kareem Giscom. Mr. Giscom is the CEO and founder of Plant Ag, located in West Philadelphia, uh, West, excuse me, West Palm Beach, Florida. He also serves as chair of of uh, Plant Ag, uh, Plant for Tomorrow, and has extensive experience working in the investment banking industry, previously for Bank of America, and as a former director for Merrill Lynch. Welcome to you, Mr. Gisicom. Our next witness is Mr. Aaron Godwa. Mr. Gadwa is the managing director of BC Sigler and Company Investment Bank, located in Chicago, Illinois, and has worked for 30 years in public and corporate finance, extensively in green and renewable projects. Welcome. Our third witness today is Mr. Edward Verbakale. Mr. Verbakil is the CEO of VP Group and co-founder of Antrium Agri Group, both located in the Netherlands. He has almost 30 years of experience designing and building controlled environment agriculture facilities in countries around the world. Our fourth witness today is Mr. Jason Kelly. Mr. Kelly serves as managing partner to IBM, strategic partners in Austin, Texas. He manages a global team at IBM that is responsible for over 750 client engagements around blockchain. In addition to serving in corporate America, he has served our country as a very brave U.S. Army Airborne Ranger. Thank you. Our fifth and final witness today is Mr. Kevin Safrance. Mr. Safrance is the Executive Vice Chairman of Mastronomedy, generation, a fourth generation family operated business in greenhouse productions located in Lafonia, Michigan. 
Mr. Severance has over two decades of experience in the fresh produce industry. And I am so pleased to have such a distinguished international group on this panel to deal with this urgent issue. There is nothing more important than maintaining our food security. As we all know, we can do without just about everything else, but we cannot do without food. So thank you all for your participation. The timer will be visible on the screen, as I said, and a countdown to zero. And I know there are so many members that want to get on, and we're going to move through this as quickly as we can. So let us start first with you, Mr. Gascom. You're recognized for five minutes. Please begin when you are ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to address you here today. My name is Karim Jaskom. I'm the chairman and chief executive officer of Plant Agricultural Systems. Today I speak on behalf of the people, which you as a committee and the broader administration serve, the American people, people who represent multiple generations and races and who share a common thread, the belief that we can be our best, achieve the most, and expect the best here in America. I also speak on behalf of a broader ecosystem of industry participants serving the fresh produce supply chain, who collectively cover not only all the roads, roles from seed to plate here in America, but do so all over the world, and can provide valuable context and insight to the delivery of a 21st century food system. However, today, those very things are at risk as COVID-19 and adverse weather instances, such as the droughts being experienced in the Colorado Basin, continue to force our collective appreciation of the fragility of the essential services which enable the people who then enable the economy. I am here because my children, the, just as every child in America, deserves fresh, nutritious, contaminant-free fruits and vegetables they can trust. I'm here because no parent should have to come face to face with their child's mortality, especially not from the simple act of eating a salad the way Lucas Parker's parents have had to. I am here because it's critical that you, our trusted lawmakers, fully appreciate the threat that is facing our way of life, the clear and present danger to our agricultural system, and act to protect our domestic food supply chains and infrastructure while stewarding our collective environmental impact. I am here because we can no longer ignore the obvious. No more than we can go back to simpler times, and we do not have the time to overthink this situation. If we want to ensure no other country such as China, or Russia, or Mexico, or even Canada can control our fresh produce supply, it is absolutely necessary to decrease our reliance on these imports which currently top some 53% of consumption, and swiftly and with intention, increase the scale of controlled environment agriculture production in America. Sometimes looking back is necessary to see far enough ahead to understand what the choices made today mean for tomorrow. This country has never forgotten the value of our independence as we grill hot dogs and hamburgers every July 4th. And I ask everyone here and watching to think and tell me what you see when you hear the word hamburger. Truth is, that image does not need to be verbalized because we all know exactly what it looks like. Two of the ingredients synonymous with that image, lettuce and tomatoes, are statistically the most commonly consumed and purchased products in America, and more broadly the world. Today, sourcing them has become more and more challenging across the globe. The USDA just issued guidance this week regarding increasing food prices, and that is in line with global trends. Later this year, when lettuce prices skyrocket because of the California droughts, it is the American consumer who you represent that will be the ones impacted again. This is but one of the reasons we're having and must continue this conversation. This conversation is about choice. First, the right of every person who eats a sandwich, salad, taco, wrap, slice of pizza, bowl of cereal with fruit in it, or who drinks a smoothie at home or from a food service retailer in this country to trust their choice of product and to trust their choice of outlet or restaurant to be fresh, 
nutritious, and safe. The actions of the FDA through the recent Food Safety Modernization Act are to date the best steps towards enabling the trust of the consumer, but it is and will only be as effective as the infrastructure in place to support the mandates outlined in the new area of food safety blueprint. This is about the choice you, as lawmakers, must make to understand and acknowledge the role of the underdog in this story, controlled environment agriculture, as not only a necessary contributor, but the most viable solution if the American people want to trust their food again. This is about the choice to build the infrastructure necessary to enable American producers to have a viable platform to grow and expand their businesses and be competitive in an open market where the consumer speaks with their dollar as they do with their vote. So let's go back to where I started. This is about the people, the people you serve, everybody. Members of the committee, you need look no further than the hardworking franchisees of Subway, the largest food service retailer in the world, with more than 30,000 locations, and listen to their highly publicized complaints about the corporation and the lack of quality and transparency of fresh lettuce they are forced to serve their consumers. How much longer before the other sandwich retailers encounter the same? In closing, I respectfully ask the committee to consider the following. With what you now know, the urgency to protect our fresh produce supply chain should be beyond question. And your first choice is whether the American consumer will pay for it with their tax dollars or enable the fan. I'm Thank sorry, you. your time has expired. We're going to be on a quick gavel today. Our members are very anxious to get their questions in, and so much more can be added at question time. Thank you. And um, next, uh, we have uh, Mr. Verbakale. And if I am mispronouncing any of the names, please forgive me, but I, uh, I trust you. I'm trying. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I feel honored to be uh, present here today, although from a distance, I would have liked to be there, but uh, I'm somewhat limited to, to be there in person. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is known for agriculture since a very long time. Uh, we have to be specialized in, in trade because of uh, our favorable climate and our uh, scarcity of land. So all what our industry has been doing over the past decades is focus on optimization of everything that can be related to growing of fresh produce. Um, I'm second generation in our company. My father founded it in 1966. Um, he was one of the very first entrepreneurs in the U.S. market to start with greenhouse technology in 71 on Long Island, New York. And ever since we've been exploring your country and been active in over 25 states. And what we see all the time is, is there is an immense production of agricultural produce, but the climate change is limiting you in providing the um, even as a fresh food. And at the same time, the consumer wants that fresh produce every day. So what we've been doing is focusing on what plants deserve best. What do they need to optimize growth? And we have been able to replicate some of the climate uh, challenges that we have. If there's a shortage of light, we can add light. If there's a shortage of humidity or cooling, we can add that within a controlled environment. Those are all high technological solutions by which we can produce fresh food uh, 365 days year round. At the same time, we are also active in other continents. And what we see is a very striking uh, yeah, comparison between countries is that other countries, with all respect, are a little bit more progressed in applying this controlled agricultural environments than uh, compared to, to the US. So there are many opportunities to continue and focus more on controlled agricultural environment solutions within the continental United States and limit the import of produce coming from the north or from the south uh, where possible. If we compare this to uh, countries like China and Russia, we see that there is a high uh, element of um, dedication to uh, import uh, technology and become more self-sustainable. We can do the same here on the US side as well, but we need a, a bit more support also from government levels. And that's not only uh, in, in the fact of making this possible uh, in terms of financing, but also in terms of uh, permitting and making it available that uh, all of the local authorities involved are supporting those ideas. I think that there are many opportunities in the US market to continue to feed the, the world, uh, more specifically within the US. 
uh, we are coming from a tiny little country. We have, uh, you have almost 17 times more um, um, inhabitants within the uh, United States compared to our country. But at the same time, our uh, um, greenhouse surface per capita is much higher. And we see the same in, uh, in other areas in the world. So I would like to, uh, to close uh, this uh, um, by, by asking you to be uh, more in support of controlled agricultural environments and help um, the, the U.S. population to have access to safe and healthy food and um, cope with all of the, the, the challenges that we have, both in climate, reduce uh, transport distance, make food available local for local, in a sustainable way by focusing more on the use of energy, the use of water, fresh water, uh, where greenhouses, for instance, have 15 times less water consumption than uh, compared to open field production. And I think there are, uh, there are many opportunities that lie ahead of us. So I would like to uh, ask you to make this, um, this, um, this, this travel here on forward and, um, and do this together. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very, very much, Mr. Forbacow. And now we will turn to, for five minutes, Mr. Gadwa. Thank you for inviting me to participate in the discussion today. I appreciate the opportunity to provide a perspective on how capital is being deployed to develop controlled environment agriculture facilities and food system infrastructure. I'd like to address three topics this morning. Firstly, provide an overview based on what we are seeing in the marketplace of food system infrastructure, how it's being financed today. Secondly, summarize the limitations that private investors face in deploying capital towards this asset class. And thirdly, suggest a path forward to unlock additional sources of capital based on our experiences of what have worked in the past and our knowledge on how these investments can be structured. It's clear that innovations in technology and processes are transforming food production and supply chain infrastructure. What was essentially a land-centered platform has diversified into controlled environment agriculture. A confluence of recent technology and demand for food safety and sustainable production has put us at an inflection point where scalable food systems require large capital expenditures that ideally, ideally are financed just the way any industrial project is, namely with a combination of equity and debt. What we're seeing today, however, is a significant flow of private and public equity capital being allocated to ag tech and controlled environment facilities. Private equity sources typically fund 100% of the capital expenditures of an indoor facility. Equity as a sole source of capital is an exceedingly expensive plan of finance for large scale projects. It's true that there are many traditional economic development tools out there, but they are not sufficient to finance the the scale of the production and facilities that are necessary. The heavy lifting is almost entirely done by equity. Private equity can't do it by itself to provide all the capital that is needed, nor can the public equity markets, particularly SPACs, which you've seen a lot of special purpose acquisition corps, they have become subject to regulatory scrutiny and will, that will likely curtail their use in the future. The financial institutions and capital markets clearly envision the promise of modernizing our food system infrastructure. In addition to food safety and accountability, the production of food on an environmentally sustainable basis is directly in alignment with integrating ESG values, that is environmental, social, and corporate governance values, into their investment portfolios. Investors want to participate in a systematic way. Why then are institutional investors, particularly fixed income investors, staying on the sidelines? The reason for this is investors perceive the food system as a loosely defined jumble of food-related businesses. Institutional investors have difficulty organizing a credit framework because the food system is not currently viewed as an asset class. Industry participants and in government can play a role to better define and empower the food system sector. The development of the clean energy and waste to energy sector is a good analogy for this. 15 years ago, this sector was viewed as fragmented, poorly defined, and risky. Today, investments in renewables are considered an established asset class. The same can be done here for ag infrastructure. Designated controlled environment agricultural as critical infrastructure is a good place to start with this. 
we can also identify a subset of investors within the fixed income capital markets that would be perfectly suited to be the lead investor in this new asset class. Certain mutual funds, managed accounts, and insurance companies that invest in high yield tax exempt bonds possess in-house expertise that can commit their capital to non-governmental projects that qualify for tax exempt financing under the tax code. Perhaps more importantly, Many tax-exempt investment funds have specific mandates to support projects that have social impact, that are consistent with ESG values, or finance facilities that are deemed to be publicly beneficial. This group of investors have deep, has access to deep pockets of capital and will commit their attention. Here's an example. Credible investment candidates in the renewable space that are often too small to be of interest to corporate bond investors can be purchased by tax-exempt funds. Here's another very common example, an otherwise well-structured deal with limited operating history as a project that, that would be viewed as a risky startup by corporate bond investors could be purchased and evaluated by a tax-exempt fund. This tax-exempt marketplace serves as an economic development tool that is unique to the U.S. capital markets and provides a source of debt financing where other alternatives may not exist. Amidst the ideas and plans of innovators, industry participants, government, at the end of the day, it is the financing that makes it all happen. We can accelerate the development of food system infrastructure in this country by establishing a platform to attract and unlock capital to this sector. Thank you. You were right on time. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, we will hear from Mr. Yeah. Mr. Kelly, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Thompson. I'm IBM's General Manager for Global Strategic Partners in Blockchain. I manage teams around the world responsible for more than 1,000 blockchain client engagements with large companies like Dole and Walmart and small farms such as those that Representative Pingree, LaMalfa, and Halter are familiar with. Like a, a number of you representatives, I'm also a veteran having had the privilege of serving our country as a U.S. Army Airborne Ranger. It's a pleasure today to testify on blockchain and its potential to vastly reduce the cost and complexity of food safety while adding trust and security. Blockchain can enable transparency, shared visibility, accountable monitoring of production and reclamation with more effective food safety and sustainability practices. My testimony will further explain blockchain and share more about its value. Blockchain is a secure cloud-based technology. It is a shared, immutable ledger for recording transactions and tracking assets transparently among a trusted, invited network. Each permission participant has an exact copy of the ledger. All information a member wants to share, the who, the what, when, and where, even the condition of a transaction, such as temperature of a food shipment, is recorded as, as a data block on the ledger, which is propagated throughout the network. Each block is connected to the blocks before and after it, forming a chain of data blocks, if you will, that track an asset from its source to its consumption. Each block is linked together with encryption, securely preventing any alteration without detection and permission. With this, all permission participants, such as a supply chain, have trusted, up-to-date, transparent information. Blockchain, however, is not a panacea. Instead, it can provide substantial improvements over the status quo, enabling greater trust and security, better efficiencies and resiliency, as well as improved sustainability. Today's partial digital and paper documentation across an increasingly complex network of food suppliers, distributors, and retailers makes accountability slow, security questionable, and threats increased. As a result, food recalls cost about $30 million per incident and comprise all those things that we like to have with consumer trust. Blockchain provides immediate, shared, and completely transparent information to the specific person who's permissioned to see it. Simply put, it promotes trust. If food safety issue is reported, if any, any issue is reported, those using blockchain would immediately know who is impacted and the potential actions they could take. This can improve efficiencies and resiliency. According to the UN, 1.4 billion tons of perishable food is wasted each year due to inefficiencies. That's one-third of all processed food. Blockchain can eliminate time wasted in audits and reconciliations since participants know the origin, real-time location, and status of their food products. Further, integrating artificial intelligence with blockchain provides retailers with insights to proactively remove products before an issue even occurs and predict inventory needs 
flattening the demand spikes in the lulls. Enabling a blockchain that tracks product loss, waste, and expiration dates could save over $150 billion annually in food waste. As I close with sustainability, blockchain can enable sustainability practice to help reduce the ecological footprint and food supply uh, challenges that we have day to day. Farmers, greenhouses, and producers could easily share audits, certificates, and documentation validating their sustainable and ethical practices. Distributors, transporters, and retailers could be better informed to make sustainable choices. With blockchain and AI, they can get suggestions on the most sustainable shipping methods, routes, and local sourcing opportunities. So, with blockchain, a trusted way to share data, which it is, consumers can confidently know the origin of their food and how green and clean it just may be. Traceability, security, and sustainability go hand in hand. Blockchain can enable, can enable that and even more. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Thompson and the committee for this time I've had to speak with you today. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Safrant, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Thompson, for holding a hearing to discuss this extremely important topic of Controlled Environment Agriculture, or CEA, and for inviting Machinardi Produce to appear before you and share a perspective story. Machinardi Produce is a fourth-generation family-operated business devoted to providing high-quality fresh fruits and vegetables to people across North America and beyond. As a pioneer and industry leader in greenhouse farming, Masternardi prides itself on producing consistently flavorful produce in an environmentally and worker-friendly manner. We are the largest CEA farming and distribution operation in North America. Our direct workforce represents approximately 4,000 jobs across the U.S. We have farms in five states, Michigan, New York, Maine, Ohio, Colorado, and cool distribution facilities in another five states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Texas, Florida, and California. We've called this hearing today to examine the contribution CEA farming can make to protect uh, domestic food supply chains and infrastructure. We believe CEA farming is the key to sustainably and efficiently strengthening the America's food supply chain and would like to offer several key thoughts on this. Firstly, because of the unique way in which a ride a range of fruits and vegetables can be grown indoors, CEA farming enables more produce to be grown closer to stores and retailers that serve American consumers. Increasing domestic CEA farming would significantly help to address the problem of relying on more and more imports to feed America. Currently, more than half of all fruits and vegetables, or fruits and nearly one-third of all vegetables, are imported to the U.S., including 61 percent of all tomatoes. To balance this trend, the U.S. must embrace CEA, which is widely used in Europe, Canada, and Mexico, to meet growing consumer demand. Much of the rest of the world is far ahead of us in achieving domestic food security through CEA acreage, as there is approximately 520,000 acres of CEA in Europe, 50,000 in Mexico, compared to only 6,000 in the United States. Second. CEA farming permits the grower to control and monitor virtually all of the elements of the environment, from the nutrients the plants receive to advanced computer systems with hundreds of thousands of data points to control and adjust humidity, temperature, light, climate, and other environmental factors. Environmental sustainability is at the forefront of many conversations these days, and it is always a primary consideration of CEA farmers. CEA greenhouses use 10 times less water and require 10 times less land than conventional farms. And they also significantly reduce the produce sector's carbon footprint since they can be built in specific areas to shorten distances from greenhouses to customers. They use integrated pest management systems to minimize the use of pesticides and have pioneered a traceback food safety system to reduce foodborne illnesses. Third, the primary barrier to sustaining in expanding CEA operations in America is that we, like many other firms, lack a stable workforce to help us uh, with operations and harvesting. Despite our farms being climate controlled and the day-to-day -day work being done without being subject to harsh elements, CEA farms, again similar to many other farms, struggle to attract 
and maintain a stable workforce despite our efforts to eagerly seek out and hire uh, qualified domestic workers. Whenever we are unable to find those qualified workers, we are forced to turn to contractors or the H-2A program. The program, however, has grown cumbersome and unreliable for this modern and sustainable type of farming that frankly wasn't contemplated when the H-2A program was first developed. In fact, during the pandemic, we grew more food than we were able to even harvest with our current workforce, which meant we were forced to throw food away rather than harvest it and sell it or donate it. The U.S. has an opportunity to meet growing consumer demand with expanded U.S. production of fresh produce, and Master Nardi is proud to add its name to a long list of businesses and organizations asking Congress to act on the issue of agricultural label, which will in turn help our domestic food supply chain. We urge committee members to continue to work with their counterparts in the Senate to pass the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, but also to address the unique needs of our segment of the industry as part of that reform legislation. This will unleash a new era in American agriculture, one that grows far more of our produce domestically on environmentally controlled farms that provide lower cost, higher quality, and most importantly, reliable produce that American consumers demand to live healthier lives. I want to thank this committee for the chance to discuss our business and the remarkable opportunities controlled environmental agriculture presents to the United States. CEA Farms and Fruits and Vegetables they produce will allow us to meet the challenge of feeding a growing population of healthier foods. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate all of the just simply outstanding testimonies that each of you have given. Now we'll go to questions with members and I'll ask a couple, then I'll turn it over to the ranking member. We'll go to members. Uh, first of all, let me ask Mr. Giscom, if you, um, what is ag plant? How does it work? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Plant AG, uh, as we like to call it. You might want to move your microphone closer to your voice. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Now Sorry I about that. I was saying Plant AG is a distributed network production system based on the simple principle of bringing the production facilities for controlled environment agriculture near more close to the population dense centers, metropolitan statistical areas. Because of this technology, as Mr. Safran said earlier, we're now able to do significantly more with significantly less land space by simply moving from further away, which is what the traditional distribution networks look like, to being in closer proximity to where people who are consuming this on a day-to-day -day basis are, we stand to not only increase production, limit the amount of natural resource depletion, and most importantly, increase the level of quality of that produce that's coming to the consumer. And so, would it be, uh a good understanding of what Ag Plant does that you are able to help us with food security by using technology and the latest scientific uh, processes to be able to grow food inside without the natural light or rain? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The beauty of controlled environment agriculture is that you're eliminating a lot of that variability. In fact, I would say statistically, you reduce about 96% of the risk of, tradition, of, of the uh, contaminants from airborne pathogens and bacteria. You're also no longer susceptible to any kind of weather conditions. No more than we sitting in this room today are susceptible to the humidity outside in D.C. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Godway, in your testimony, you uh, mentioned something that uh, I want you to explain a little further. We were talking about fin financial and equity, and then you made this statement describing this financial situation in ag. You called it a loosely defined jungle. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Oh, please turn your mic on. Is that better? Yeah, here we go. 
Yes, make, come a little closer. We want to really hear what you have to say here. Go ahead. What investors are really looking for is an asset class which has some institutional meaning. And right now, the food system is not really widely known amongst institutional, particularly fixed income investors. There, there is a combination of food production. There is food distribution. There is social type programs out there which provide food to the needy. There's food research. All of this right now, because it is so literally known with portfolio managers, insurance company managers, pension funds, and so forth, uh, it, it's been very, very difficult educating them. So the, the, the point here is that by designating an asset class, particularly something which has an industrial capacity to it, something which is a capital expenditure, something that can be, can, can be financed, is intangible, that would, be, that would be doing the same thing that we did 15 years ago with the analogy of renewable energy. It was just as little known, just as little defined, but by, by having examples where there are multiple sources of capital to provide that kind of funding for large capital expenditures, that will solidify in investors' mind what a, a, a new asset class is called food infrastructure. Thank you very much. And now, Ranking Member, I will turn to you for your questions. Well, Chairman, thank you very much. Thanks for this uh, hearing. I, uh, one of my most recent um, visits, uh, well, actually, it was probably in 2020, and now if I think about it at this point, to a, um, a farm operation, farm market, was Yannix in uh, Indiana County. Uh, traditional agriculture production, but they, they're able to supplement and extend their season using hydroponics and having a, also a controlled climate right in the middle of that that production agriculture. It was pretty, pretty impressive, actually, very impressive. So I appreciate all of our witnesses here today. Uh, Mr. Safrance, um, as we know, through adopting new practices and innovative technologies, our farmers, ranchers, and producers have made it possible to have the safest, most abundant, and most affordable food and fiber supply in the history of the world. And while there's always room for improvement, and that's with agriculture, I think we all agree is really is American agriculture is science, technology, and innovation always has been kind of rude and uh, crude and rudimentary at first, but very sophisticated today. Um, you know, those I, I strongly disagree with those who say the only way to fix our food system is completely start over. Mr. France, as the executive vice chairman of one of the companies really leading greenhouse growing in North America, what are, what are your thoughts on that statement? Um, yeah, I don't believe the supply chain is broken at all. I, I feel that uh, we should focus on what we're not doing correctly and uh, celebrate what we are doing correctly. Um, I think the biggest problem we have in our supply chain right now is availability of product. Currently in our industry, we're importing a lot from uh, different countries. And if you know there's border issues or other issues in other countries, then these products don't show up on time and that creates empty store shelves. I can tell you from our experience, um, we have five distribution centers across the United States. If we have the product in our building, we can get an order in the morning. We can ship it out that afternoon and have it delivered the next day almost 100% of the time. Very good. Uh, as, as I was listening to testimony, I, I heard a few witnesses mention how getting access to capital is one of the biggest limiting factors of entry into controlled environment agriculture. I, I, I think access to capital obviously is a big issue across all aspects of the food supply chain. Um, certainly for those young and new and beginning farmers, uh, we know it's a big issue as well. So getting access to credit and capital is not just an issue in the controlled environment agriculture industry, but it's something that producers experience across the entire agriculture industry. Uh, Master Nardi Produce has been involved in the greenhouse growing industry for four generations now. Mr. Safranza, uh, how has uh, Master Nardi been able to gain access to the capital needed to, to build these ground, not just the greenhouses, but the distribution facilities across the United States without the use of exempt facility bonds like uh, our other witnesses are calling for today? Yeah, in our history, um, everything we've done has been just traditional bank financing and or equity um, off our balance sheet. Very good. Um, I think just because we're on a tight time frame, uh, 
Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back the balance of my time. Very Keep good. Keep it efficient. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that, uh, Ranking Member. You're a good man. Now uh, we will recognize Mr. McGovern of Massachusetts for five minutes. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of our witnesses uh, and to uh, Chairman Scott. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, talk about supply chains and efficiencies quickly become jargony. Uh, and I worry people may lose the forest for the trees. Um, you know, I appreciate that our witnesses uh, today did a great job explaining uh, what may be a new topic uh, for some people. But in that vein, I'd like to take a minute to kind of center the conversation. Uh, you know, we're talking about building a resilient food system. Uh, that means strengthening local food systems, expanding opportunity for farmers, ensuring justice uh, for farm workers, and guaranteeing access to nutritious food um, essentially as a human right. Uh, and I think it's really important that, uh, you know, we take a, a, a holistic approach to food security um, so that we can fulfill the goal of, of trying to end hunger in this country uh, once and for all. In fact, um, uh, and my colleagues maybe are tired of me talking about this, but I'm, I'm, I've been pressing this administration, the Biden administration, uh, uh, to uh, convene a White House conference on food, nutrition, health, and hunger. Um, because we need to tie all, everything together. It's not just one thing, it's a whole bunch of things. And um, Mr. Giscombe, I, I appreciate that you put things in perspective in your testimony. You said that you are here because your children, uh, just as every child in America, deserves fresh, nutritious, contaminant-free fruits and vegetables that they can trust. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'd like to ask you to expand on this a little bit. Uh, how can CEAs uh, help end hunger in America? Uh, and, you know, and one of the most important things about food security is realizing that ending hunger is not just about quantity, it's about quality uh, as well. And the second question would be, can you elaborate on how CEAs can expand access to fresh food? Thank you, Congressman. Um, first and foremost, I would say CEA cannot end hunger in America. What CEA can do, as you so appropriately stated, is supplement the other elements of agricultural production in the United States of America to better equip the overall supply chain to be more efficient and effective in the delivery of fresh, high-quality, contaminant-free and nutritious products. Um, one of the key things about controlled environment agriculture is the last comment I just made. By moving indoors, you eliminate the majority of the risk to airborne pathogens and bacteria, which are the leading causes of foodborne illness in America. Um, every year, I, I, actually going back to 2011, there's been more than six million cases of outbreaks, I'm sorry, of contaminations um, and, and illnesses caused from that. And it's devastating. So when you think about if we have the opportunity to simply leverage this specific kind of platform as a part of the broader collective of agricultural production, that is the first step in our belief to moving towards being able to address hunger. Did I answer your question, Congress? I did, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, and I, 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 I know we're on a tight schedule here, so I want to be very quick, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we talk a lot about food insecurity, uh, but we also have to add, you know, there's uh, nutritious, nutrition insecurity as well. Uh, and uh, as we battle issues like food insecurity and hunger, we also have to pay close attention to the importance of nutrition as well. Uh, and, um, but I, I appreciate uh, the perspectives that all of you have presented here today, and I think this is an important hearing. Yeah, Mr. Giscombe. I just wanted to add one more thing. Going back to nutrition, it's probably not commonly known that when a fresh produce item travels more than 4,500 miles, it loses upwards of 50% of its nutritional value. So when you think about it, if what we're focused on is delivering higher quality, more nutritious products, one of the first steps has got to be to limit the distance that item has to travel to get to its consumption. I, that's a good point. Somebody went to time explain to me the, uh, the, a, a tomato coming from the West Coast to Massachusetts, where I live, and I, you know, with all the shipping and the, uh, and the uh, refrigeration and the, all the stuff that it went through, I felt bad for the tomato. Uh, that was in the grocery store. But in any event, I think that's a very good point, and I thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, uh, 
chairman of our rules committee, Mr. McGovern, thank you. And you're right, you've been a longtime champion of fighting hunger and uh, good to have you. Now I will recognize Mr. Austin Scott of Georgia. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate you having this committee. Uh, I, I do think it's good that we're talking about the, uh, the number of miles that a, a, a tomato or any other fresh fruit and vegetable travels before it, it's actually able to make it to the shelves of, of our local grocery store. Um, I, I want to ask if I could, Mr. French, you, do, you have greenhouses, greenhouse operations in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. If I if I understand your your testimony correctly, is that is that accurate? Um, we own greenhouses in Canada, in the United States, States and a uh, small partnership in Mexico, and we have uh, growers that work for us in all three countries, on a supply basis. Okay, and and you um, you have greenhouses that are as large as four acres. Is that correct? Yeah, we have some that are much larger than that. Really? So so how how large would your largest Green, if you don't mind. Yeah, in a single facility, 64 acres. 64 acres. And that's one greenhouse, or is that multiple greenhouses on 64 acres? That, that would be one facility composed of two ranges of 32, 32 acres. Wow. That's, that's a big greenhouse. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's large. So, so uh, where I come from in South Georgia, most of my fruit and vegetable growers, they, they have greenhouses and they, they grow out the plant. But then uh, you take this plant, which is, as you know, would be significantly smaller than uh, one, one tomato and you, and you transplant it then into, into, into the fields. Uh, if I understand your operation though, you're actually growing the whole plant and the vegetable out in your greenhouses. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. So, so do you do any transplanting or is all of yours totally in, internal to the greenhouse? Yeah, no, everything we do is indoors. Okay. Um, well, my, my kids love your, your sugar, is it sugar bombs? Yes, is that, <laughs> yep. Uh, and, uh, and my wife makes me buy them when I go to the grocery store too. So I'm, and, uh, and I eat them too. So, so you've got great products. Thank you. I get, I guess my concern is when we talk about uh, the fact that we're importing, if you will, 61% of the tomatoes that, that are they're eaten in this in this country. Uh, what what is your wage rate in Mexico versus your wage rate in the United States? Yeah, um, I don't operate the greenhouses in Mexico, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, I believe the wage rate in Mexico is probably around uh, 14 or 15 dollars a day. Um, our greenhouses in the United States pay roughly um, a base wage of uh, 13 to 15 dollars an hour, and with the piece rate, many people are achieving more than 20 dollars an hour. Right. So, so you're 14 to 15 a day in Mexico. Yeah, I mean that would be an average of all the growers in Mexico. I would say. Okay, and and so this this is something that I think you know when we talk about the the sustainability and and, and the food supply chain, wh why are sixty one percent of the the tomatoes that we consume in the United States actually transported thousands of miles uh, to make it to the grocery store? And and one of the things that concerns me that our growers are fighting uh, in the U.S. is that. $15 a day wage in Mexico versus, as you said, I mean, $15 an hour would, it, 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 most people that are working in the fields make, make, make a good bit more than that because, it, it, you know, they're paid by production. And um, so there, there's a reason that, that they come to America to work and they work very hard. I've worked in the butter bean fields myself when I was uh, a younger, younger man. And, um, I didn't make I didn't make fifteen dollars an hour back then. It was whatever the minimum wage was at the time. But the 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 wage disparity between the U.S. and Mexico to me seems to be one of the reasons why our produce has to travel so far to make it to the shelves. Would you agree with that? 
No, I, I don't agree with that, actually. I think a lot of it has to do with growing seasons and proper growing climates. Um, okay. Some of the areas in Mexico have the best areas of climate to grow, much like California year-round. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost out of time. I apologize for interrupting you. I really do. So, so I'm in South Georgia, so my growing season is effectively the same as uh, as portions of Mexico. And, and Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, but I appreciate the hearing. I am concerned about the U.S. producers and what they what they have to compete with coming from foreign countries and, and the lower cost of operations in foreign countries. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And now I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your leadership and for this hearing today. Uh, I think focusing on protecting America's domestic food supply chain, as you and I have discussed before, is a national security issue. And therefore, it's critical that the House Ag Committee uh, indicate how we need to focus on innovation as we move forward. Uh, the sustainability of our domestic food supply is critical. Uh, and I, for one, believe that we should take an all of above approach and I appreciate the testimony of uh, our witnesses here today. Uh, let me make a note. You know, the Chinese government uh, 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 and our last uh, colleague talking about remaining competitive, they spend $3 billion a year on innovation to modernize their agriculture. We've got three million, three billion for China, we do three million uh, for our support within the USDA. That's not being competitive. Uh, put simply, America is not keeping up on research and development, our capacity for these investments that are absolutely necessary and we're neglecting, I think as a result, our food security. You know, we, President Lincoln in 1862, July 2nd, signed the Morrill Act to create land-grant universities. That was infrastructure, that was boldness, that was vision. In California, we're utilizing some of this cutting-edge technology on innovative agriculture using our uh, research universities, but also uh, the private sector. I want to uh, highlight Plenty, a company in California in which I visited their vertical agricultural investments. Plenty, so named because they want to produce additional food supply in America. Plenty, meaning plenty more food for America. Um, I would like uh, unanimous consent, uh, Mr. Chairman, to submit their uh, testimony here for the record. Unanimous consent, granted. Thank you. Uh, in highlighting this effort, uh, I want to note that um, they have um, uh, developed a, a, a um, pilot project effort that I've witnessed last w year and this year they are building a, a very large project in Compton, California. And their plan is, is like other of our witnesses here today testified, to create these kinds of vertical uh, growth uh, facilities in major cities in America that will provide jobs and provide additional uh, high quality um, food that because you control the environment and, and I farm, as some of you know, and farming's risky. And, you know, there's some factors you just can't control out on the farm, and that's the weather. But the ability to grow these products uh, in a controlled environment, I think, is critical. And that's really what controlled environmental agriculture stands for. CEA, -E controlled environment agriculture. And so these technologies are critical I think, for the future sustainability of, of putting food on America's dinner table every night, and that's the goal. Now, I have a couple quick questions because this effort, and I urge all my colleagues to view in your area where uh, vertical growth agriculture is taking place under controlled environment agriculture circumstances, because I think there are public-private partnerships that are critical. Uh, Mr. Gadol, um, you talked about exempt facility structure to help fund significant capital expenditures. We're talking about market tax credits. Where do we help provide the financing to encourage more of this effort? Well, to your point, Congressman Costa, um, there's, there, there's so much that's needed. There's so much infrastructure. It's critical to the country, and it is going to be distributed all over, the, all over the country. In order to make that happen, we need to diversify as much capital as available as possible. 
And in addition to tax credits, tax increment financing, and some of the other economic development tools that are out there, and they're out there, but the, 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 the truth is, and we've seen this, is they're all for relatively small projects. They simply do not address the type of scale of the capital expenditures that are gonna be necessary here. So in, in looking at what's been successful in the past, we think that an obvious source of capital, because so many investors are just natural buyers, naturally aligned with this type of infrastructure, a new classification of exempt facility bonds would go very, very far in diversifying that kind of capital. That's My time's almost needed. expired here, but Mr. Chairman, I think in our next hearing, we need to look at more tools to try to help provide the financing in these public-private partnerships and our universities throughout the country. Certainly, Mr. Constant, thank you. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, something here today that uh, is uh, growing in interest in our, in our country. Uh, control environment agriculture is important not only because it diversifies product production methods for existing farmers, but it also serves as a testing ground for many new technologies uh, before uh, traditional farmers actually incorporate them. You know, we need to understand the limitations of this industry as well. Uh, food security is a national security issue. And our primary responsibility must be always to ensure that our country's food supply remains secure. I believe that these production methods we are discussing today do have a role uh, in the potential of buying more of our food to be produced domestically. In my district, I toured in October 2020 the Better Fresh Farms located in Metter, Georgia. Uh, these CEA farms are built inside of mobile containers and are so are able to be relocated easily. The ability of these farms have to bring fresh produce right to a population center is an inventive method by which we might eradicate many of the food deserts throughout America. Uh, before I begin my questioning, I'd like to draw attention to an important matter uh, that uh, Mr. Sufferance made in his opening statement. He stated that the primary barrier his farm faces is the lack of a stable workforce. And this is exactly the number one issue that uh, farmers tell me they face as well. Uh, this Congress, I introduced a bill that would uh, move administration of H-2A programs from the Department of Labor to the USDA. Department of Labor is fundamentally cross-purpose with the H-2A program. That department is also out of touch with particularly needs of the ag industry, much of which uh, arise from timing sensitivities due to planning and harvesting schedules, as well as the weather. And I hope that the Ag Committee will hold a hearing this Congress where we can look at my bill in greater detail and can have expert witnesses testify on, on how we can improve our H-2A programs. Uh, Mr. Suffers, in your testimony, you brought attention to the fact that nearly two thirds of fr uh, fresh fruits and vegetables imported into, uh, imported into and consumed annually in the US. Uh, you explained how uh, Mr. Nauta pr pr uh, produce is able to remain competitive in this market. Uh, how are you able to do that? Uh, from a labor perspective? Yes, sir. Um, well, when it comes to controlled environment agriculture, um, they're much more efficient from a labor perspective. Um, we have a lot of, uh, I guess, automation and also um, different um, things in the greenhouse where it's very ergonomical and um, there's a lot of different pieces in there that can help us uh, get the labor done at a faster rate than in a field without having to bend over and things like that. So that's how we try to uh, stay competitive. But at the end of the day, we just really struggle with the actual numbers of people that we uh, get in the greenhouses. And uh, it's been a problem ever since uh, we've been doing business here in the United States, which is many, many years. And uh, it's, that's, that's the much largest problem we have today is just getting enough people. And uh, we've got, I've got about a minute and 30 seconds left and I'd like to ask all of our witnesses, uh, what, what's your biggest challenge in that, uh, in the controlled environment agriculture production? Uh, what, and what are the biggest challenge that, that challenges does, our, does that industry face? And I'll start, uh, you, you know, we start with the, our witnesses to each comment on that very quickly. Any challenges? <laughs> well, I'll go I ahead. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. 
Go ahead. No, I'll just say our, our number one issue is uh, quantity of labor. We try to hire and endorse all the American workers we can. And at the end of the day, we just can't get enough people. We physically uh, go out and promote uh, radio ads, all kinds of things, and just physically don't get the amount of interest that we would like. For us at the moment, there is a backlog in transportation uh, availability for trucks uh, to get the containers out of port. So the material delivery from port to building site is, is a big challenge, but I think uh, this will uh, this will be solved uh, within a year uh, and, and this will not be the long term challenges. We are looking for more collaborations within the US market to be also domestically a supplier uh, together with uh, what we know and let it manufacture uh, in the United States. Um, well, I'm out of time. Uh, I, will, I will mention that I did visit uh, Bertel Harvest in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and uh, they came, they did something very creative. Uh, they used uh, people uh, uh, with disabilities uh, to harvest, and these folks were, uh, <laughs> were full of energy and were amazing workers. And uh, so it may be we can. Uh, uh, Mr. Allen, your time has uh, expired. Yes, sir. Thank you. And now I recognize the general lady from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, the vice chair of the Agriculture Committee. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, for hosting the hearing today. To our witnesses, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, in my district in Mecklenburg County in North Carolina, nearly 15% of the population lives in what the USDA considers a food desert. Uh, often found in low-income communities, these residents don't have access to a full-service grocery store or nutritious food. And experts suggest that living in a food desert may put people at an, at an increased risk of obesity, diabetes, and other weight-related conditions which is why I'm particularly interested to hear how applying controlled environment practices to urban agriculture could aid efforts to achieve food security and improve access to healthy food in food, food deserts, deserts across the country. Uh, already urban agricultural technologies are increasing the availability of food, which is especially important in communities with limited access to affordable uh, fresh produce like my community. Mr. Giscombe. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in my district, 15% of the population lives in a food desert. So can you address how controlled environment systems help communities located in food des deserts, and how can these systems mitigate food insecurity? Congresswoman, thank you. Great question, and I appreciate it. Um, as I said before, one of the biggest challenges is the location and proximity of where our agricultural production is today. What that leads to is significant costs in transporting the items that are produced to their, their area of consumption. Controlled environment agriculture has the ability to be located, whether it be in the metropolitan city areas like we spoke about with our colleagues at Plenty, um, or Bowery Farms, or um, any of the others that are practicing vertical agriculture, but what you will see is there are no greenhouses that you can put in the middle of a city center. Right? Real estate is extremely expensive, extremely valuable, and we're trying to address things such as employment, housing, which is a critical issue. So when you think about what's the best and most efficient use of real estate for agricultural production and making that proximate to where the consumption is, there's got to be some middle ground. So by being within, let's say, you know, six, eight, even a 10 hour radius, of a metropolitan statistical area, you can eliminate up to 30 cents worth of logistical cost per item, which means that the retailers, the distributors who are subsequently delivering that produce to your retail outlet and your food service outlets now have a benefit. Their margins okay. become larger. And at the end of the day, economics is what drives businesses. So okay. I, I, I would submit that if you're able to bring the cost of agricultural production within a certain level, you're going to also be able to pass that on and ensure that greater quality food gets to the people that you're speaking about. Okay, so would the food produced in these controlled environments be as nutritious as the food grown in a field? And could there be micronutrient deficiencies in some crops? 
That's a phenomenal question, and I will say this um, very matter-of-factly. It is absolutely as nutritious, and we can argue whether or not it is more nutritious. When you grow inside a greenhouse or in a vertical farm, we, there's no use of pesticides or herbicides. That's number one. Because you're able to control every element of nutrient that that item is receiving, whether it be a lettuce, uh, whether it be tomatoes like we have displayed here today, or cucumbers, they're all in higher quality. So by the time okay. they get to, and again, as I said, traveling a shorter distance, it preserves the nutritional quality. Okay, so let me, let me move on. Thank you so much. Mr. Verkabal, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that there's no escaping the significant capital expenditures necessary to develop a controlled environment or facility. So what are the potential infrastructure, resource, and energy costs associated with CEA facilities, and how do they compare with traditional uh, production agriculture systems? Initially, and the capital investment costs are, of course, much higher compared to open field farming. But in the long run, the, the greenhouses can also serve as an asset. So from an investment perspective, that is much more interesting than just invest, investing in, in the pure land. And to, to your point from where you're from, uh, one of our clients literally farms from Devons, Massachusetts, is going to invest in Burnsville, North Carolina, where they will uh, yeah, realize a 20 acre a complete controlled agricultural environment for lettuce production. I see we are running out of time, and I want to give the word back to you. Okay, well, great. Well, th thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to yield my six minutes back, Mr. Chairman. My six seconds, excuse me. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now, <clears throat> I recognize Mr. Balderson um, from the great state of Ohio. Five minutes. Mr. Balderson, you may want to unmute. If not, we will go to Miss Moore of, uh, or Mr. Moore of Alabama. Is Mr. Baird? Uh, Jim was here and he stepped down. Mr. Braun, is this? What? What's that? Yeah. All right. Miss Kamek from Florida. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Ranking Member Thompson, and thank you to our witnesses here today. Uh, the examples that we're hearing about today uh, really speak volumes of the innovation and the, the growth in hydroponics and controlled environment agriculture that are really just the tip of the iceberg, I put a pun in there, uh, of a long legacy of American agriculture innovation, which for decades has improved yields, conserved resources, preserved our environment, and helped feed the world. No doubt about it, American farmers feed not just our communities, our states, our country, but the world. I am especially proud of Plant AG, Ag. There's been discussion about what it, what it is and uh, the exciting potential that it has brought to North Florida bringing new jobs and economic development to the region. It is no secret that fruit and vegetable growers in my home state of Florida and elsewhere are hurting right now. The few tomato growers left in my home state of Florida are under tremendous pressure from the unfair dumping of cheap Mexican tomatoes on our markets. I hear from witnesses and my colleagues alike that innovation is key to the future survival of American agriculture. And so I'll just jump right in. Uh, and this will be a question really for the entire panel. How can controlled environment agriculture, because I've heard a few facts and statistics today, how can it reduce our reliance on foreign imports and preserve domestic production? And if you could keep it to the facts, because I know there's been a few that have been thrown out, I, I really want to make sure that I capture that uh, for myself and my team. And I'll start on this end over here. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, first and foremost, we need to increase the amount of controlled environment agriculture production. 
If we do that by whatever means necessary, whether we continue to look at it from a perspective as it's traditional or we actually make the move forward and consider it infrastructure and invest in that infrastructure, we will by default decrease the amount that we are importing. It is just simple math. By increasing the, the amount of acres under glass in America, which pales in comparison to that of Europe, and contrasting, Europe is significantly smaller than the United States is. And that's not just a country, it's, the, it's Europe. Do so you, all we have to do. Do you have a percentage of the difference between what is produced in Europe as opposed to the United States? The, Europe has over 500,000 acres under glass. Okay. The United States has significantly less than 10,000. Our colleagues, our Canadian colleagues in Mastronardi have 6,000 themselves. Okay. Thank you. I'll address it from a cost of capital perspective. Thank you. The more capital is out there and the less expensive it is, is only going to make these facilities more competitive. And that's really what it comes down to. That will, it all comes down to price and where demand's going to come from. The other point I want to make is the more data points you have with public capital, with bond financing, and the way that disclosure is done, best practices, that's, that's for everyone to see, and the more of those publicly available data points we have, the more and more competitive our capital is going to be. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? Congresswoman Kamak, you grew up on a cattle ranch, I yes, believe, I if I'm right, right, right? So you and I'm sure the rest of the committee can appreciate what's the good of good food with bad data. You have to have good data. And if you can control the variables, so control the amount of data, therefore it stands to reason that you're able to control the output and have good data about that produce or outcome that you're producing. So therefore, that should increase the value. Therefore, that could distinguish that product amongst all products by controlling that data. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Hi, I'll go back to what Mr. Giscombe was saying um, about not having enough uh, CEA um, greenhouses or controlled environment agriculture in the United States. Um, the United States is significantly under-indexed compared to the rest of the world. I read a study a while back that said, I if I have this correctly, and I believe I do, that um, there was set in Europe there are 700 acres per million population, and the United States is only about 16 acres per million population. So very under-indexed, and I believe that's what's driving the imports. I think with uh, you know uh, our large expansion of CEA over the next decade that we can change that. And I think the biggest driver to doing that is not capital. I think that there's a lot of people that want to get involved, but I do believe that it has to do with uh, proper labor supply because otherwise putting that much capital in a place without the money is, or with, uh, without the people, I should say, is just way too big of a risk for anyone. Thank you. I, and I do have an, I know we're running short on time. I do have a question. I can enter it for the record. Uh, and this, this would be to my friend here, Kareem, uh, about the role of the University of Florida and the educational exchanges that you are working in partnership in concert with. And with that, my time has expired. But thank you to the witnesses for being here today for this very important issue. And I will recognize um, Mr. Cabajal from California, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm uh, honored to have one of my youngest constituents with me today by the name of Elijah joining me and asking this question. So with that, let me just start. Thank you to all the witnesses that, are, that have joined us today. Uh, the first question is for Mr. Kelly. Food security should be treated as a national security. And that's why this committee works to give individuals and families access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. Supporting the innovation and integration of controlled environmental agriculture is a tool we can use to protect domestic food supply chains and infrastructure. But it is also, but it also has a substantial dependence on new technology, which could have unforeseen risks. Mr. Kelly, what can be done to prepare for cyber attacks on our food systems? Congressman, thanks for the question. I think it's a very uh, thoughtful question in that we have seen very recently the outcomes of cyber attacks. And those cyber attacks have been on a very fragile 
and I'll echo what uh, Mr. Safran said, uh, fragile but not broken supply chain, I believe is what was stated. But that supply chain can be augmented, can be better supported with greater technology and with the ability to have greater visibility across that supply chain from source to consumption. And so, Congressman, when we think about the way that we deal with data in that supply chain right now, it's very siloed. And if we think of from production to consumption, each one of the passing of that product is just a handshake going from one step to the next. If we could implement technology that allows us to bring down those barriers and share that data in a secure and very visible way with transparency, such as I mentioned with blockchain, we can then understand who might be trying to tamper with that, that supply chain that we currently have. Not broken, but ready to be augmented with greater technology. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, my next question is for all the witnesses. This committee will eventually begin consideration of provisions that will become the next farm bill. This is a slow and deliberate process that does not seem to match your industry sense of urgency. What steps can this committee take in between farm bills to ensure that we are maintaining pace with these advanced technologies and production practices? And what existing USDA programs can be utilized to support controlled environmental activities? I'm sorry, Congressman, I didn't realize you were asking the question of me. Um, first and foremost, what the United States Department of Agriculture can do is, I think, the conversation that we're having here with the committee. There is an, an ominous need, as Mr. Kelly said earlier, to incorporate data management into our supply chain. We have the opportunity to do it, but also going back to what Mr. Uh, Gadois said, as well as Mr. Safrance, right? There are two sides to that coin. One is we need the capital to be able to make the investment in technology and innovation, right? Um, going to the other side of it with regards to labor, yes, that's a reality. It, it is not cheap. Economics drive all innovation. So by increasing the access to that capital, we will by default create the opportunity for all participants, not just in controlled environment agriculture, but agriculture broadly, to be able to leverage that. And a great example of that is, is Walmart, right? They're not a producer. Walmart made the investments because they had the access to that capital. But we're all aware they're the largest retailer in the world. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a mis no, it's no brainer. As such, what about the other participants in the supply chain that don't have the ability to do that because their capital is spread so, so, so thinly across their operations. We have to, the USDA, the committee here has to look at it from a very fundamental perspective. What are the economics of innovation? That is how we then leverage things like blockchain to be able to create this platform. Thank you very much. I know I said to all the witnesses, but I seem to have run out of time with that. I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Balderson. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the time. Uh, my question is for Mr. Safrance. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, my question is, the COVID-19 pandemic drastically changed many aspects of farming across the nation, as well as the way agricultural produce was delivered to consumers. As the only witness here today with the commercial experience producing fruits and vegetables through hydroponics, what are the biggest challenges you face during the course of a yield cycle? Um, yeah, so in the course of a yield cycle, I mean, there's you know, every, every day is a challenge. Um, the biggest challenge, uh, as I said earlier, is the labor and having enough people because if the plants get far behind on crop work, then the quality suffers and the yield suffers and then a, a greenhouse would become uh, unviable. And so 
the biggest issue we have on a day-to-day -day basis, without question, is dealing with, uh, with the labour. Is he muted? There I go again. I apologize, Mr. You're Chairman. Sorry, Mr. France. Are there any crossover benefits that controlled environmental agriculture or CEA can learn from traditional <laughs> agriculture? Um, I think the processes are similar but different at the same time. Um, I, I think they can learn from each other, and I think that there's plenty of space for them to coexist. Um, but from a crossover benefit, I mean, you know, if you, if you look at growing a, an outdoor tomato crop and an indoor tomato crop, I mean, the premises are the same, but you have a lot more tools at your exposure indoors, obviously. And uh, I believe that that's why we can get better yields and bring the cost down and be uh, competitive by growing indoors. Okay. Thank you very much for your question, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my remaining time. Thank you very much. And now I recognize... <clears throat> The general lady from Virginia, Ms. Spanberger. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. And to our witnesses, thank you so much for your uh, fantastic testimony today. Uh, I, I know many of my colleagues and I have been in a mix of in here and virtual, so I've really appreciated all of your answers and your opening comments. Uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to discuss the positive impact of controlled environment agriculture on our domestic food supply. And across my district, I've had the opportunity to visit several farms that implement controlled agriculture technology, including Bright Farms in Culpeper, Virginia. And in Goochland, Virginia, we have a new indoor growing facility opening soon that will utilize innovative technology and sustainable practices, including recirculation systems that use 95% less water than traditional growing methods. Um, I'm encouraged by some of the recent growth in the controlled environment agriculture across my district and certainly across the country. Uh, and over the last year, the COVID-19 pandemic really has laid bare some of the challenges and fragility that we see in our food supply chain. Um, I'm hopeful that controlled environment agriculture can help increase supply chain resiliency uh, and decrease dependence on foreign growers, improve food safety and trust, and mitigate some concerns like weather disruptions and drought. Um, I'm appreciative of you all being here today, and I'm going to run through a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Safrance, I'd like to begin with you. You mentioned that many of the controlled environment agriculture facilities present in the U.S. contain outdated technology. Could you describe you know, briefly some of the examples of outdated technology uh, and the better technology that is available to be leveraged. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, going back over the years, and we'll call it the last 30 years, say there's been a massive difference in technology in these greenhouses. Going back about 30 years ago and beyond, they were uh, short A-frame type greenhouses, single pane glass, um, where crops were growing in dirt and uh, usually heated with steam. And as time moved on, we got into the 80s, and a lot of people went to what's called a double poly or two layers of plastic where they blow air in between the plastic layers for more insulation. And then soon thereafter, they got into hot water heating systems. Um, and then soon thereafter that, we got into what's called a gutter system where we raise the crops up off the ground, and we use the gutters to recycle all the extra water. Um, the water will go back to our uh, irrigation rooms and go through a cloth filter, much like you'd see a coffee filter and a percolator. And then after that, it'll go through a UV sterilization system. So basically, we take the water back with the leftover nutrients in it. We make the water completely sterile, and then we add more nutrients to it and send it back on the greenhouse. So in the newer greenhouses, like you were just saying, about 95% less water, that's exactly what we do. And uh, the only water that actually leaves these greenhouses or should leave is in the weight of the fruit or the respiration of the leaves through the air. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that, I was furiously taking notes because that was a tremendous <laughs> answer. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and, and so, uh, Mr. Garuas, and I apologize that I'm directly positioned. Oh, I can see you. I'm sorry, sir. Um, how successful do you see current investments in controlled environment agriculture? Uh, so are people seeing this as a good place to invest? Certainly the technology is evolving, as Mr. Safrance just walked us through. Certainly from the information that we have, and a lot of the information is still private, more than public, uh, but from an equity perspective, there have been successes. Well, the, the most important one, but that's something we cannot change today, is the weather. When it's too cold or when there's frost in the ground in the northern part of the U.S., we are limited to, to continue our construction works. 
But uh, over the past two or three years, we've been uh, forced with, uh, or we've been confronted with some limitations to uh, to import our agricultural components. We consider a greenhouse an unassembled uh, system, which uh, is is not physically possible to ship uh, if you compare it to the surface that Mr. Sofrens compared it to a six on one boat and in mm -hmm. one batch that they consider the green uh, just a steep you know uh, given the challenges that we saw during the, the pandemic and the shortages of at the retail level for certain products uh, can you talk about your distribution system just a little bit and how you were able to service major retailers uh, during the during that period as well as how you're able to deliver to major uh, major um, stores price quality product. Very quickly, what we did with Walmart and also was work with the USDA was the thought that it takes so long to, when there's a foodborne illness recognized, to actually remedy it. Using technology such as blockchain, what used to take Walmart and their use of this technology full week to, to, to find a problem, that means a whole week of throwing away food, they were able to do it in 2.2 seconds. Find the source, remedy it, and move forward. One week to 2.2 seconds. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And we all on this uh, committee certainly congratulate you and appreciate your great service and uh, jumping out that airplane. Takes a lot of nerve in and of itself. Congratulations, thanks for having you. And now the chair will recognize the general lady from Connecticut, Miss Hayes, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My district in Connecticut is leading the way in innovative urban agriculture that make our food supply chain more resilient, brings new and beginning farmers into, into the agriculture industry, and provides fresh local foods in areas that have, that have historically lacked access to them. Among the other benefits discussed here today, controlled environment agriculture seems to provide an opportunity to address lack of access to healthy food, local products, and for underserved communities communities that have been deemed food, food deserts or food swamps. The U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates that 54.4 million Americans live in these low-income areas and have poor access to healthy foods. For city residents, that means that a person can live more than a half mile from the nearest supermarket. And when you add in the fact that many of these people are walking with groceries or riding public transportation, that distance becomes even farther. So my question today is for Mr. Verbapal. Can you address how strengthening local food systems through controlled environment agriculture can improve access to healthy foods? And does the lower cost of produce from controlled environment operations translate into lower costs and healthy foods for consumers? Thank you for your question. I, I, uh, I can say yes to both of your questions. I think the, 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 the last question is clearly something that's from an, an, an 365 day perspective and uh, the fixed cost that an operation carries uh, can, uh, can benefit into a lower price per pound or per square foot, which makes the operation more uh, competitive opposed to similar uh, operations either from the outside or from a much longer distance. At the same time, um, providing in, in labor places is something that some areas uh, appreciate. Uh, a greenhouse is a very nice area to work, especially in the winter times. In Connecticut, it can be very cold. Uh, so uh, from working in an enclosed environment with uh, good conditions, uh, as Mr. Sufren stated, is something that is also much appreciated by the workers. I want to be um, careful with the time, so I'll give the word back to you. No, you're absolutely right. My district in Connecticut has more greenhouses. Actually, it's the largest industry in my district, greenhouse growers. Um, so thank you for that. As I've discussed here uh, before, UConn, my district is home to Yukon Extension, which teaches students each year how to successfully become urban farmers with controlled environment, agriculture, and other methods. 
Some projects conducted by the program were the funding of the USDA uh, NIFA, Beginning Farmers and Ranchers programs. We have waiting lists for all of these programs in my state. In your testimony, Mr. Sanfrance, you discussed labor shortages across the food and agriculture sectors over the past year. Aside from the updates to the H-2A program that you discussed, are there other ways to incentivize domestic workers to seek opportunities in, in these types of facilities? And how do you encourage specialized education experience in controlled agriculture environments? Yeah, so um, definitely there's more we can do. Um, I think something you touched on that's very important is uh, what I would call the skilled labor side of the industry. Um, when it comes to labor management, crop management, um, crop care, supervisors, growers, assistant growers, uh, integrated pest management specialists. There's a lot of uh, really good jobs in each greenhouse, and the industry is extremely short on skilled people in those uh, parts of the greenhouse. So um, to put together an industry-wide or a university or college-type program for this um, would be an excellent idea to uh, start to cultivate the, the next people in these jobs. Um, they're all really well-paying jobs, and uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, industry to be in. It's basically recession proof. So I would highly encourage uh, as many programs as we could to uh, train the next uh, greenhouse operators for sure. And when I say greenhouse, I mean CEA. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate that. My other committee is the Committee on Edu Education and Labor. And as we discuss higher education, I try to always remind my colleagues that that has to include career and technical training, VOAG programs, any uh, any means for people to provide um, to access uh, economic opportunities and that is not always a four-year college degree so i am really pushing to expand programs like the yukon extension and boag training programs in my own district so thank you uh mr chair i yield back under time <laughs> yes thank you very much thank you very much uh miss hayes and now I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Rouser, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that very much and uh, appreciate uh, you holding uh, this hearing today. It's a very interesting uh, subject matter. Um, you know, when it comes to greenhouses, I'm, I worked on the, our family farm during the summers, and um, uh, the prospect of a 64-acre greenhouse just kind of blows my mind. I'm used to the uh, smaller uh, version um, uh, where you were growing tobacco plants that were trans, uh, transplanted to the field. Uh, same with sweet potato uh, plants as well. Uh, I have to ask, uh, what kind of investment is that? A, a 64 acre greenhouse and was that uh, all at once or was that over a long period of time? Or, or uh, uh, if you could talk a little about that a little bit, I'm just curious what kind of investment that is. Yeah, sure. That that specific one was uh, at one time, it was the largest greenhouse ever built in one consecutive built in the United States. So it's uh, at the high end of the spectrum. Uh, the investment for a facility like this, depending on the technology, um, for a vine crop, and when I say vine, I'd mean tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, things like that, um, are probably $1.5 to $2 million per acre. Um, if you get into a fully automated uh, leafy green facility, it could be upwards of $5 million an acre. They're very expensive. Wow. It strikes me that uh, it would be a very natural uh, environment to produce organically. Um, is that correct or incorrect? Or how much more effort does it take to produce organically? Yeah, uh, essentially the differences for uh, CEA organics versus conventional um, are basically down to the grow media you grow in and the fertilizer you use. We technically uh, try to never and almost never spray any kind of pesticides or anything like that anyway. So, and we all use IPM man, uh, pest management. So it just really comes down to growing in uh, different media and uh, organic fertilizer. How much more does it cost, if anything, to produce organically? Um, it costs considerably more. Um, the media is more expensive. It's much more labor to apply the fertilizers. The fertilizers are much more expensive. But um, when it comes to cost per pound, it's, it's much higher because uh, you get considerably less yield. So it drives the cost per pound up considerably. Gotcha. And I would say that the average is, I don't know, probably 30 or 35% more. How much of yours is organic that's produced? Um, in the United States, uh, we don't do any. None, okay. Not currently, no. Um, 
I assume the answer to this is no, but is there anything that cannot be produced in a greenhouse? It's just a matter of economies of scale, et cetera? <laughs> well, I mean, technically, we could probably grow orange trees in a greenhouse. I don't know if anyone's tried, but I mean, they would grow fine. I just don't know that you would ever, um, you know, get your return on your investment doing something like that. Right. So um, the, the majors are, uh, you know, leafy greens, um, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, and then now we're getting into berries indoors. We're doing a bunch of strawberries. Gotcha. It's a very, uh, very intriguing uh, subject area because, uh, you know, weather is one of the key uh, variables in every growing season uh, for every farmer out there. Uh, you know, one day they can have a great crop and the weather has been super and then a hurricane come through. Um, for example, in my district, it happens all the time uh, and ruin everything. And uh, of course, um, uh, then on the produce side, uh, uh, one state does well, the other state doesn't do well from a weather perspective, and you know how that dictates the price, et cetera. So it's a very interesting subject area. Uh, Mr. Kelly, uh, you mentioned in uh, your testimony um, uh, with regard to the Food and Drug Administration, their efforts to implement tangible, tangible strategies to modernize the food industry. I'm just curious uh, uh, to get more detail on that. When we think about how we measure the success of the food industry, it's really, are we getting food that is in high quality where it should be, when it should be there, right? And so when we think about those metrics and those measures, it's based on accuracy. And if we bring it down to what we mean by accuracy, it's trust. Trust as consumers, all of us. Uh, it's easy to ask all of us, you know, raise your hand if you eat food. Uh, back to the chairman's point at the beginning of, of, of our session here. And the work that was done with the USDA, along with some of retailers such as Walmart, was based on looking at those measures and them saying, look, how can we make sure that those measures of food safety, food quality, and the supply chain that surrounds all of that, how do we pull down some of those barriers that currently allow that data to sit into silos? And how do we do it with trust? And that's what we did with them um, as IBM, is to say, look, let's implement some technologies Augmented intelligence, some people call it artificial intelligence, but how do we do that with blockchain and make it safe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Now I recognize for five minutes the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And uh, obviously thanks to all of the witnesses uh, that are here talking about a very, a very important issue. Um, I, I, as many uh, of my colleagues know, uh, and maybe some of you know, uh, who are testifying today, I represent the Central Coast of California. And as many of my colleagues know, and maybe some of you know, uh, it is known as the salad bowl of the world. Uh, it's known that not just because I say that, it's known uh, with that appellation because we grow over a hundred different specialty crops there. Uh, in the Salinas Valley, San Juan Valley, and the Pajaro Valley on the Central Coast. Now, many, if not all, of these crops are grown outside. Uh, we got the acres of land, we got the nutritious soil, but we also have the people with the highest principles that prioritize and are very progressive when it comes to the food safety of the products. For example, most of the leafy green producers in my district belong to the leafy green marketing agreement, which actually holds its members to a more rigorous food safety standard than the FDA. Now the LGMA is representing 90% of the leafy greens grown in the United States. And when it comes to those LGMA products, there is 100% trace back to the farm and date of harvest. Even with that level of certainty, however, the growers that I represent continue to ensure an even stronger, safer, and more transparent food system. And that includes their close work and yes, even scrutiny by the FDA. It also includes their work over the years now with their Congress members and their senators to secure strong language in our appropriations bills on food traceability and traceback and partnerships under the Food Safety Modernization Act. Now, most recently, we were able to secure language in the fiscal year 2022 House Appropriations Bill that provides an increase of $9.5 million to facilitate, facilitate traceability and enhance outbreak response. 
It's language like that in that bill, which encourages the FDA to work in closer partnership with existing government food safety programs and especially crop industry, and also allows them to share and coordinate information and data with industry partners and state and local governments so that they can better coordinate before, during, and sometimes, yes, as we know, unfortunately, after an outbreak occurs. Now, my language uh, that I got in that bill also directs the FDA to capture point of sale details, such as the lot number and product identifier throughout the supply chain. It also ensures that those details are maintained from the point of origination through the retail food or food service establishment. Now, I believe that we can continue to advance our food safety technology. We're going to get better. But we, to do that, we must work closely with especially crop growers so that we can continue to build on the industry's decades of work and leading role in addressing food safety issues. Now, Mr. Kelly, you and IBM uh, have talked, you and representing IBM have done a, a, an amazing job and you've talked a lot about it today. But I also want to um, basically talk about your work, not just with the small leafy green farms in California, because you understand firsthand that these types of operations are committed, absolutely committed to delivering fresh, safe, nutritious food to consumers. And you know that these types of producers, they're willing to do what's necessary so that their products are identifiable and traceable should any issues arise. You also know though, that we got some work to do uh, when it comes to speeding up our traceability and trace back efforts. So I know you've hit on it a little bit, but talk to me as we look to the future the need and, and what in the, the need to further develop our capacity to trace our food products more efficiently. What, what can blockchain technology do to continue to support these ongoing efforts? If you could, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Congressman. When we think about what you've laid out there, which I thought you did very well with regards to talk about the source all the way to consumption, and you include it point of sale, so there's a retailer in there. What has to happen is when we look at going forward, we know that safe food is a team sport. And in order for it to be a team sport, there has to be this sharing, trusted sharing of information. And that trusted sharing has to be something that pulls down the barriers that we currently have with regards to the accuracy of the data, the speed at which we can share that data. As I called out, Walmart set the the, the, the uh, very high bar when they went from one week to just a couple seconds. Great, thank you. My time is up. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to all the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Very good. Thank you very much. And now I will recognize uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Lamafa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll just dive right in here on, uh, on uh, for Mr. Sir France on uh, the labor issue. You know, we've, uh, several of us been on this committee, been working really hard on that. So I see my friend uh, Mr. Panetta nodding. We've uh, put together pretty good legislation. I want to be part of it: the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. What's a, sorry? I didn't hear the end of that. Oh, the, the bill we passed out of the House twice, actually, the Farm Workforce Modernization, Moderniz if I could say it, Modernization Act. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question, though. Oh, have, have you heard of that yet, that we passed out of the House? Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, absolutely. Good, right on. All right. Because uh, obviously ag labor has been an issue for quite some time and having uh, a uh, known size and uh, Legal workforce has, has become a very important issue. There's a lot of other outside politics. It's uh, actually a tremendous effort, a bi tre tremendous bipartisan effort to get that bill through the House, and it's waiting over the Senate for action. Um, but uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, we've got everybody from American Farm Bureau to people in the labor industry side uh, all trying to find a way on this thing. Uh, tell us about what your uh, struggles are with the greenhouses for staffing and keeping our workforce together and, and uh, what do you think uh, do, you, do you think what you've seen of our bill or just in general that you see some kind of hope for a, a farm workforce that will be uh, yeah so I the biggest issue we have is getting uh, enough local labor 
Um, it's always been a challenge for us. And, you know, I've talked to many other people in the farming space in the United States, including field farms, and um, everybody kind of seems to have the same sediment. Um, the biggest problem we have, and I think CEA will have, is when the, the I guess the, the legislation was made in the 80s um, for H-2A labor, um, they didn't contemplate greenhouses. And they have, uh, you know, this provision that it needs to be seasonal and greenhouses and CEA are actually seasonal to, to a certain aspect. But, um, you know, when we get finished with our crop, we have to literally take the entire crop out of the greenhouse, take all the media that it grows in out, sterilize the greenhouse, replant it. I mean, the equivalent would be, you know, an apple farmer shows a season by saying, hey, we need to prune some trees. We need to pick the apples and then we're done for the season. Well. Ours, if we were the apple company, would say, now we got to take all the trees out. We need to remove all the soil, bring all new soil back in, plant all new trees. So it, it is a seasonal uh, uh, issue, but uh, it just looks differently than what you know normal people are um, thinking about in terms of a field agriculture. So I think that we need to have a look at that for CEA, that uh, it kind of uh, in some way, shape, or form understands how our seasons work compared to a, and that they're not the same as a, a field type scenario. So yeah, you have a lot more of that infrastructure, obviously, with, with the greenhouses. Um, our bill tried to play, pay close attention to seasonality as well as the uh, needs of some of our year-round ag uh, issues such as dairy like that. Sure. So uh, if, um, if you have more uh, suggestions on how that could look moving along, then certainly want that to be part of the discussion. Um, what else do you think Congress can be doing? You know, you've brought, you've brought that issue up. Uh, what, what other frustrations or issues do you think Congress should be addressing on that to make this go farther? Well, I mean, I don't know that it pertains to the bill, but I think it's frustrating that there's, uh, you know, we apply for H-2A and occasionally sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't, but there's never a proper reason why. And uh, it's very inconsistent. So I think we need to address the consistency of it so that people that want to invest in these expensive facilities can be assured that they're going to have the labor to operate them properly. Otherwise, uh, nobody will ever continue to build these because they won't be able to make money. That makes sense. So we, we were fighting for more flexibility on, on that program as well. So uh, let me shift gears a little bit to Mr. Kelly over there at IBM. Um, can you follow up a little bit more on the, the food traceability? I mean, uh, that's very amazing technology to be able to track as closely as you can. Can you emphasize a little bit more on if there's a question about food quality or, or food uh, safety on a recall type situation or what, what, I guess, you know, recalls come pretty wide, pretty blanket when they have an issue with some kind of a meat product or vegetable product. Do you see this as helping to narrow the amount of, uh, of product that would have to be removed from the shelf? Because they, they talk like a pretty broad amounts of uh, product and, you know, in tonnage or packaging or what have you. What, what do you see the potential is for this uh, traceability, maybe helping to narrow the amount of food we have to take off the shelf and it goes to waste? So I think uh, we may have to yield my answer based on the time uh, from oh, the chairman. <laughs> so <laughs> on the with regards to food going to waste on the shelf, Congressman, what I, I think uh, you're calling out is the ability to have increased data about the time that those SKUs, and if, when we talk about numbers of SKUs, some, some of that, uh, now when we first started with some 6,000 SKUs, now we're able to manage some 75,000 SKUs in a blockchain network that says, look, let's look at all of that. And if you can understand that very complex network of not just one ingredient, I mean, as we sit here, it's not just one tomato, but it's a tomato and a sausage and a grain product and a pizza. So now you're talking about when does that go bad? And if we could manage those, those timings of when something is really just ready to go bad before it does and, and being able to then also move it from a shelf perhaps to the food desert that was mentioned early by the Congresswoman. That's what we're talking about with timely data, data that's available and shared and timely action that can be taken with that data. So okay. when we start thinking okay. about what we could do, that's what we're talking about, Congressman. Thanks so much. And you? thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Mr. LaMalfa and our entire committee. But before we adjourn today, I want to invite our distinguished ranking member
to share his closing remarks. Ranking Member Thompson. Chairman, thank you so much, and thank you to all of our witnesses for really contributing to a, a great discussion in this hearing. You know, American agriculture is, once again, and it always has been, science, technology, and innovation. And uh, as I said before, early on, those first farmers who were just trying to survive a winter, it was probably pretty crude and, and rudimentary. Uh, today, it's very sophisticated. You know, one of the statistics I shared in my opening statement just rings true, the fact that our productivity of American agriculture has increased 287% since the 1940s. And, and today's hearing showcased a great example of this. So I really want to thank our, uh, our witnesses. I want to build off what um, our, our mutual friend from uh, California, Mr. Costa, talked about the importance of innovation investments. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree with him more. That's, that's what we do with the Farm Bill. That's what we do in this committee. We, we continue that tradition of American agriculture increasing the productivity yeah, and continuing to develop in terms of the science and technology and innovation. And that's good for everything, not just nutrition, not just, uh, you know, it's, it's the rural economy, it's the environment. You know, that's the positive outcomes we get. So in that spirit, <laughs> I would just like to close my remarks at uh, asking, uh, uh, I just want to recognize in terms of investments and innovation, this committee's unified work to, to invest $43.2 billion in rural broadband, uh, which is needed for our continued innovation. You know, with, uh, and I'd like to certainly encourage all, all the members of our committee to join the chairman and I and, and calling on leadership to, to put what we passed unanimously, which was a great reflection of innovation and technology, on the House floor, the, the Broadband Internet Connections for Rural America Act. We, uh, rural America needs this, and I always say that without a robust rural economy, people in the, all people, including those in the cities, are going to wake up in the cold, dark, and hungry. Um, and, um, and so I'll just, uh, 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 I guess I won't say anything more. I'll just yield back, thank you, Chairman. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, I know the uh, attending physician told me to keep my mask on, tell him I did for the entire meeting. <laughs> but because you brought up our bill, Folks, what if we do not get rural broadband connection to the internet, much of what you're talking about, controlled environment, how can we accomplish any of this indoor farming if our farmers, if our agriculture producers are not connected to the internet? And ranking member, you're absolutely right. If there are those of you under the sound of my voice, please call your members of Congress, call the leadership, call the White House, call everybody. This committee has passed a very good bill to finally bring rural broadband to our rural areas. We passed it bipartisan. Every single Republican and Democrat came together. It is the only bill, as we're moving for the infrastructure, that the Congress has to address this. So in order for us to make this hearing meaningful, in order for us to be able to have controlled environment agriculture, which you all stand for, using cutting edge technology. We can't do it unless our rural communities, that's where farming is. That's what our pioneers, the shoulders we stand on in 1936, 
when our rural communities did not have electricity. They called on us. It was agriculture. It was our agriculture committee back then joining forces with our United States Department of Agriculture that brought electricity to rural America. This is the foundation we're building on. But yet, our bill sits in the House and does not have a vote. And we're asking, we are pleading with the bipartisanship of this Congress to please pass our bill because this is the only way we're going to be able to make real the advocacy, the programs, the promises to fulfill our true destiny, to make food available and secure for the American people for generations and centuries to come. We have to move it indoors, climate, and not only that, there's just so much land. Everything is there on the table, but we got to get rural broadband into our rural communities. Thank you for your partnership on that, and thank you for giving me the opportunity <laughs> to back you up. And if you see the attending physician, please tell him that I did put my mask back on at the end. But I had to say that. Thank you. And so I want to thank Mr. Giscom, Planag. Thank you. Mr. Gadswa, Mr. Furbanel Kell, Mr. Kelly, and Mr. Sarfrance. Thank you all for this brilliant and intensive and very good testimony. And we're going to build on this foundation. This is why we have the hearings. And we will pull this in. And then, then we're coming back so we can give you the legislative help that you need to complete your task of bringing controlled environment agriculture into real time and real life for our great nation. With that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>